welcome Anne and Emily to um, our chat today. Um, and yeah, I'm really looking forward to this because we're coming into that season of being uh, the weather, not playing ball, or, or literally not playing ball, but I've got questions about that, obviously. Um, into our summer, I should say, shouldn't I? So um, anyway, but Anne and Emily, would you like to introduce yourselves, please? Yeah, so my name's Anne Carter. I've been a canny crosser for about the last 12 years now, um, and I bike draw as well, um, but also I... Um, have been doing canine research for crikey about 15 years now um and currently doing research on heat related illness in dogs and particularly canny cross dogs fantastic um, i'm emily i was a, well i kind of am still a small animal vet um but i don't work in practice anymore i've been teaching um vet nurses for the past six years and Anne dragged me into this research project <laughs> kicking and screaming um <laughs> <laughs> and I can't even run up a flight of stairs, let alone behind a dog for 5k. So I absolutely do not take part. And whilst I can lunge my cat, um, I don't think Catty Cross is going to take off in the near future. Um, and yeah, I'm also part of the hot dogs team researching heat related illness in dogs. I love that idea of Catty Cross. I think that's <laughs> something that you do. <laughs> Perfect. Oh, brilliant. Um, I mean, I thought we'd probably start the chat off by asking, you know, what got you interested in the research in the first place? Just tell us a little bit about it, really. Um, I think it started off as one of those things where life and research tend to gel together. Um, my, my initial background was um, sort of dog behaviour and welfare in the research side of things. And then... Um, I started canny crossing um, when I lived down in Dorset with a friend's dog um, and, and moved up to Nottingham about 10 years ago and, and got my own dog and then started to get those questions coming through of thinking about the canny cross has very much been a winter sport but more and more we're seeing people running their dogs sort of in in the spring to autumn the weather is getting warmer and then people are starting to eke into running in the summer and it started to, to sort of build those questions of, well, is it safe to be doing this? Not what do we need to be aware of? Um, what are the risk factors for our dogs? And, and so said so the two started to overlap. Um, and then I met Emily at, at work. So she started a couple of years after I did um, and, and dragged her in, as she says. <laughs> but Emily, you must have had some interest in it. <laughs> Yeah, so as a small animal vet, I've treated dogs with, with heat stroke. Um, and one case that always sticks in my mind was actually a booster. And it was a, a big, hulking 50 kilo dog de Bordeaux <clears throat> being dragged in for his booster in 35 degree heat walking through central Leicester. And he arrived with a, a you know, a heck of a temperature. And I'm there going, this dog can't have his booster. He's got heat stroke. This is ridiculous. And having to cool him and, and manage him. And, you know, the owner's absolute shock and horror that dogs can get heat stroke not in a car. So, yeah. And, and you know, we laugh, but actually a lot of the population, their exposure to education about canine heat stroke is dogs die in hot cars. So they have that mantra drilled into them and they think, well, you know, yes, it can get to 50 degrees in a car. So I can understand that my dog could overheat in 50 degrees. And they don't necessarily understand that you can also overheat just by exercising. And whilst as humans, we might think of, you know, getting heat strokers going out and running a marathon on a hot day. Um, and people obviously do. And, and, and sadly, recently, hundreds of people died, didn't they, in, a, in an yeah. endurance event. Yeah. So it can affect people as well. But our dogs can be at risk at much lower temperatures doing much less intensity exercise so yeah when Anne then showed me a video of running behind a dog for 5k I was absolutely horrified well, <laughs> no it looked brilliant and fun but no way I was doing that um but yeah no and then when she started discussing the fact that actually you know we raced them at Easter and some Easter's it's you know it's the high 20s um and yeah we we just didn't know when we started this research project kind of what the dangers really were and it's actually really interesting because uh, Anne, I was at Box End when they, it, was, it must have been September um, when they reduced it because it was really, really hot. It was that yeah. not last year, the year before, wasn't it? Yeah. And we did a mile and that was my first ever canny cross run, um, you know, with, with a black Labrador. I don't know if that makes such a difference. But yeah. <laughs> um, and yeah, I mean, we just did a mile and, and then I was straight in the water with her yeah. afterwards. But yeah, I remember that all that talk. But 
my next question, what are the early signs of heat stroke in a dog? I mean, I don't know. Um, traditionally, it's been really poorly defined. And traditionally, we've always used the human definitions. And the human definitions are very much based on how you feel. Mm -hmm. So it's, you know, I feel lightheaded. I feel dizzy. I feel thirsty. I feel sick. And, you know, whilst we can pick up some cues from our dogs that they might be feeling that way, there's nothing you can really put your finger on. So we used the vet compass data, which is veterinary clinical records of dogs from all over the UK. And we established which signs appear to suggest you've just got mild early illness and which ones suggest you've got quite severe illness that could well be life threatening. And yet yeah, the early signs are really subtle. It's changes in breathing. So panting heavily, not stopping panting when the exercise or the heat disappears. It's also lethargy stiffness reluctance to move and also changes in the way your dog's moving one of our friends um and actually veterinary professional and canny crosser took her dog out for a run in february and you think february you know mm. it's cold that's fine it was when it was pushing towards 20 in the evening and you know she just took him for a fairly short walk but she clocked that his running pattern had changed slightly and he wasn't quite as coordinated as he normally is and he was breathing very heavily and she thought do you know what bam this this is it these are the early stages so she pulled him up and cooled him down and is very grateful that she did because yes the early signs yeah. are very subtle and, and i know who that was actually now yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and i think it's it's really is about having that awareness of your dog you know you, yeah. you can't overstress the knowing your dog knowing what's normal for your dog and then having that real of awareness even as emily said if if you don't think well it's not that hot but actually if your dog's changing in any way that's a good marker to say actually no i need to stop i need to cool them i need to slow down it's really difficult and i don't know michelle if you have the same problem though to, to and yes i I do know my dog, <laughs> I'm sure I do, but my dog pants a lot anyway. Um, and, and, and half of that I think is excitement uh, of going out. So it is a bit, you know, to, I, I'm gonna have to look at her in a different way, I think, is the, to see that subtle change. I don't know, Michelle, if you have the same sort of things. With yeah, I think, I think the key for me is what Emily's just said about if, if they don't stop panting once you stop the exercise, I guess that's, the trigger isn't it to think right there's something wrong here yeah. but it's putting all the signs together I think and it's just learning it's learning to notice what's different what's not normal isn't it I think yeah. and I think that the key is if you're in any doubt stop you know that's yeah that's the main thing with it I think sometimes there's a feeling of oh well I've only got a little bit further to go or well I was going to do a, a 5k loop so you know it'll, it'll be all right and and actually it's that recognition of going no I don't need to do that distance today I can cut it short um, I can stop and walk and I think sometimes dogs aren't necessarily very good at making that decision for us and that's also quite important I think we've had a lot of people saying my dog's okay they will carry on pulling and actually I think you get the different types of dogs I mean I have four dogs and I have one who once it gets to sort of over 10 degrees he's not particularly fast he'll very much self-regulate and he'll stop pulling and I'm not too worried about him my pointers on the other hand um, if I didn't regulate them they would keep going um, and they worry me a lot more because they don't have so much of that off switch and, and they're almost high risk because I have to be the one to say, no, you're getting too hot. You need to stop. They would run till they collapsed if, if I let them. I have a dog like that as well. I think, you know, she would, well, in that she will run until I, I stop her. Yeah. Um, yeah. She hasn't got that off switch, yeah. which is, is quite frightening sometimes. Yeah. Um, yeah. No, I'm learning loads here already. <laughs> <laughs> it's, it's how they respond to you stopping as well you know if you're looking at your dog and you're thinking okay that's panting and you know I know that's what they look like when they're panting normally it is quite a different panting mm. when they go into the kind of the the cycle of trying to cool and and trying to, to pants to cool you know their tongue gets a lot longer people often talk about their tongue becoming like a spade shape at the bottom and you know we, we've got some pictures of dogs and their tongue's virtually on the floor and if you stop and that panting instantly, you know, the tongue shortens, 
kind of the effort reduces, their chest mm. isn't blowing quite so much, the rate decreases, well, then they're cooling down and they're coping and they're fine. It's when you stop and that doesn't happen and they just keep blowing. That's when you've got to go, okay, right, we need some water. Mm. Mm. Okay, I'm going to be looking at my dog in a very different day, way when I go at Cali Crossing again now, which is, uh, yeah, Michelle. Yeah, so I mean, it's, yeah, it's, it's fascinating chatting to you both. <laughs> so in terms of cooling the dog down, I, I suppose it's just, it's finding some shade, stopping the exercise, finding them some water, and that'll be a quick recovery process for them, won't it, if, we, if we've caught it early? Yes. Um, I mean, how bad can it get, I guess, is the next question. Um, I mean, so stage two, what we would call moderate, um, you can see seizures. Mm. And obviously the moment that happens, you're going to be distraught because yeah. um, it's quite unpleasant watching a dog fit. It's unpleasant watching anybody fit. Um, you will start to see their GI tract be affected. So a bit like we all, well, I always have the image of Paula Radford at the side of the marathon. I'm sorry, but it's a, it's a perfect reminder, you know, diarrhea, vomiting, really mm. drooling because they're feeling sick. So, you know, if your dog is sick whilst exercising, okay, they might have eaten something that you didn't realise before you set off. And you might know that your dog will chuck up quite frequently anyway. But to me, that's an early sign that things are starting to advance a little bit. Um, and certainly if they're not responding to you cooling down and the clinical signs are carrying on and they're maybe starting to escalate. Once you get up into the severe stage, the dogs we looked at, less than half of them survived that. So you've got blood in the um, blood in the vomit, blood in the diarrhea you might see them start to develop bleeding under their skin so if you've got a pale dog you could see that anywhere on their body if you've got a dark dog gums eyelids prep use vulva um, those sorts of places the, the ventral belly quite frequently the tongue um, and then really losing consciousness starting to behave really quite confused staggering around like they're drunk fitting that carries on so they don't come out of the seizure or they have a seizure they go into another seizure and another seizure and ultimately losing consciousness and once they've lost consciousness that is that is bad news 90 percent of the dogs in our study that had lost consciousness died Mm. Wow, that's scary, scary to hear, isn't it? <laughs> and yeah, this is that... why it's so key with catching that yeah. early and and responding to it as well. And as you said, getting them into the shade, getting them, if you've got access to water, dousing them in water. It doesn't matter what water it is, whether it's a river, um, you know, a, a hose, any water you've got. Um, and just obviously making sure you keep their head out of the way if they're a bit wobbly so that so that they can breathe but ultimately we want to cool them down and we need to do it pretty quickly um, there is suggestion out there that you shouldn't douse them in water because of the risk of going into cold shock but ultimately the important thing is to cool them down and actually that it you know dousing them in water is the most effective way to do that so I, when I'm canny crossing in the winter and on really cold days when there's snow on the ground, pickle will often go in the water and sometimes I, because it's easy, I mean I'm still attached as well mostly, <laughs> <laughs> but I don't go in, I don't go in I promise, but, but she goes in and she seems quite happy to go in so it's still for her even in February and as you said well that's when, when Hannah had the problem wasn't it so yeah. it's still her way of cooling down. Absolutely. And so do they naturally is that is that a natural thing for her she's like water i need to cool down or is it is yeah yeah, yeah. you'll see the dogs like you know because because we one of the studies we did we were taking temperatures on the finish line and there'd be dogs that we could just about get their temperature before they literally dragged their owners into the nearest lake puddle paddling pool whatever was available because yeah they very quickly realized that if i get in there i'm gonna cool down quite quickly um you know and if you look at wild animals you'll see wild animals doing the same thing you'll see you know tigers painted wolves what have you wading into the nearest body of water to cool down because it, it's just it's the most effective means and again it's that awareness of differences between dogs so again using mine as an example I've got one who does not do water until the point that he needed hydrotherapy last year he did not go in water he didn't go near water water was evil um and then I've got another one who just bog wallows um and in the winter it doesn't matter whether it's a puddle whether it's mud he's in it um and he runs quite warm 
so actually for him he knows it's an effective way to cool off and even if it's zero degrees he will still find a, a bog to end up in I'm wondering if I, I'm, and I'm just, you know, from all the things you're starting to say, and yes, I know pickle pants, but I'm just wondering if she runs quite warm, actually, um, just because she's always panting. There's, and she'll jump in the water. There is a lot of variability when we've looked at. So we, we had a um, when we looked at dogs at Canny Cross races and we looked at them as a baseline temperature sort of pre-race and then we looked at them post-race. And whereas with humans, you've got a sort of set temperature that you're looking at for people in dogs, it is a range. And so we've got the, the hotter dogs that we had that we knew run hot. Um, they were almost in sort of a normal situation. You'd be thinking, oh, you need to be really careful with that dog. Whereas we knew that from the study that these dogs just ran hot. And likewise, we had some at the bottom end of the scale that would be there in two coats and be really cold so we do see that variability and again it's useful to know what your dog's normal body temperature is so you've got an idea of of what you're looking at and and then what hot is as well i run with a vet i've introduced him to canny cross so, <laughs> so i might just get him to bring his thermometer along or just say <laughs> next time well, you've got to learn these things, haven't you? So, um, well, so today I took her for a walk, I haven't been kind of crossing, um, and, and I just wondered about humidity because it is really hot out there today. But obviously, if you look at, well, I know you've obviously got sunshine, Michelle, again, but it's not, <laughs> it's not down here. <laughs> no, we've, got, we've had rain all day. Oh, wait, where are you? Nottingham, I'm Leicestershire, we Yeah. So yeah, no, Leicester's we, not raining, but it's grey over. No, I canny crossed in the rain this morning. It wasn't forecast, but we had some. But it is, even just going on for a walk, uh, it was just, I was I was really hot by the time I got back. So so how, does humidity, ha humidity yeah. have its own effect or, or should we be looking out for other things? So where we've done the research side of things, we've looked at the combination of temperature humidity sorry say that again <laughs> temperature humidity wind speed and where we could solar radiation so that gives you your feels like temperature because ultimately if you go out in the garden in the middle of summer and you're there in a the t-shirt and you're sunbathing and it's lovely and warm and then the sun goes behind the cloud the wind picks up and you think I need to go and get a jumper so the temperature, the ambient temperature hasn't changed, but the other factors are kicking in. Humidity is a big factor because it affects their capacity to cool themselves. But then the wind speed and the solar radiation will also affect that complete feels like temperature. So it's really important to consider all of the factors and not just the ambient temperature itself. So if they've got a bit of wind and it's a cooling wind, then, then that's a, a way that they can cool themselves as well. So it sort of makes things a little bit easier. Yeah. You've got two key phases. You've got the dog kind of pre-panting and that dog will be constantly losing heat to its environment just through radiation, conduction and convection. So every time, you know, every bit of their surface that's in contact with the ground or with the air around them, they are constantly losing a little bit of heat. You know, it's why we all have to eat every day. Um, we're doing the same. <laughs> So once they start exercising and they sort of tip over that, what we'd call the thermoneutral zone, so the, the where their temperature is normal, then you'll start to see them trying to cool. And panting is the primary way that dogs do that. And panting is completely reliant upon the evaporation of water. So if you're already inhaling water that is you know, full of humidity, then you're not going to be effectively losing its heat as, as quickly. So yeah, the higher humidity gets, it does have a real impact on them trying to cool. And you have really got to watch that. It's why in the UK, it, it's such a pain because we quite often get very wet heat rather than dry heat. And yeah, that's not great for cooling. No, and uh, yeah. And as you say, if people say it's raining out there, they probably think, oh, it's all right, I'll go out for a, go out for a canny cross. The rain isn't quite so bad because you get that cooling component to it. It's the sort of pre and post. So I said I ran this morning and at the point it was raining, it was lovely. Yeah. The minute it stops raining, you can feel that humidity start to rise. Albeit I was running at six o'clock this morning as well. So it was, a, it was cooler. Um, but yes, humidity is, is a big one so, to watch I out mean, for. Are there certain breeds of dogs that are predisposed to feeling the heat more or is it just very individual? 
there are breeds that we've identified as being at greater risk but i think the message i you know can recommend people accept is that any dog is at risk yeah. so the breeds that are most at risk are your flat-faced dogs your brachycephalics um i know people do run with pugs and french mm. bulldogs i don't think i've ever seen anyone try and run with a bulldog i don't know if a bulldog could run i don't know if i'm allowed to say that <laughs> 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 i think it you know it very much depends on their confirmation but yeah your flat-faced dogs you know look at the length of their nose that is their cooling yeah. system you've effectively wiped it out so they are going to overheat much much quicker mm -hmm. um some of the other breeds that we found that were at higher risk surprised us a little bit so you know golden retrievers springer spaniels greyhounds you kind of think the greyhound is perfectly adapted for cooling so what's going on there and there are deeper factors involved so our suspicion is that the golden retriever springer spaniel element is that I must please you and I must be with you and I must do everything you ask of me and I won't stop until I literally collapse and die. Um, whereas the greyhound, we suspect most of the greyhounds that had heat straight were old. So they probably had an underlying disease and something they commonly get when they get older is laryngeal paralysis, mm -hmm. where the um, airway no longer opens when they try to breathe. So rather than breathing through a nice open kind of windpipe, you're trying to breathe through completely closed off flattened straw um, and any dog with laryngeal paralysis is at real risk of overheating we we had a golden retriever and she used to get heat stroke in the middle of winter because she just couldn't move enough air so she was overheating and do their coats have a, 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 a impact on it as well because and go on yeah <laughs> and you were about to say something there <laughs> The honest answer is we don't know. It's a real challenge because the dogs that tend to be really, really hairy don't tend to be flat faced. And often people will moderate how they kind of manage a dog with a very thick coat and their coats vary by time of year. Mm -hmm. So, I mean, certainly a thick coat once you are already hot is going to keep the heat in and it's going to make it harder to cool that animal because getting water to their skin which is where you need it to cool them down is really challenging that said if the animal's not exercising then it probably doesn't make much of a difference um so if you needed to cool a dog in an emergency i'd want it to not have a big thick coat because that would make things much much harder so what i don't know enough about this but double coats i believe that my dog has a double coat so how does that work and is and is that a good thing to have or a also i'm not going to change her but <laughs> <laughs> exactly and that and that's the thing and and provided that they're working within kind of their limits it probably doesn't make that much of a difference it's a bit like it's insulation right essentially and obviously insulation works both ways so once she gets hot, it's going to keep her a little bit hotter for longer than Anne's naked pointers, for example, um, <laughs> which will cool quite quickly. Um, if she's just sunbathing in the garden, actually, your dog might be better than Anne's dog because that coat will also be reflecting the sun's rays. Yeah. So the coat will be reflecting radiant heat and helping to keep her a little bit cooler, just sunbathing and, and kind of mooching about. But the moment you start exercising, kind of the heat's coming from internal so it doesn't really matter so yeah a big thick coat is going to trap heat and make it harder to cool so what about so what about we've, we've talked a bit about greyhounds as they get older um developing diseases that can affect them does does a dog's general age and fitness um put them more at risk yeah. So some fairly early work done on heat stroke and cooling in dogs in general. Um, if you were to repeat <laughs> some of the barbaric studies, one of them, they literally put dogs in a cage for 12 weeks um, and they ran them when they were really quite fit. And then they ran them after they'd been confined to a cage for 12 weeks. And not only did they get hotter a heck of a lot quicker, they also took a lot longer to cool down. So if your dog is unfit, they are yeah. going to overheat quicker. And it's that's I think sort of fairly basic if Anne and I climb a flight of stairs and gets to the top and turns round, and I am sweating halfway up behind her I overheat a lot quicker because I am not fit um, and our dogs are exactly the same so if your dog has been injured if you've given them the summer off 
you know, if they've had surgery, anything where they've had a break in their fitness, you are going to have lost that level of heat tolerance. So you're going to have to be careful. They're going to overheat quicker and they're going to take longer to cool. And yes, if they're unwell. So that's not only any underlying issues. Is that you, Anne? <laughs> Yes. <laughs> um, heart problems and breathing problems in particular, because, you know, pumping the blood around the body helps with cooling. And obviously moving air is the crucial thing for our dog's cooling. So if your dog has kennel cough, for example, they're going to be at risk of overheating whilst they've got kennel cough. Um, and from a vet point of view, I'd rather you weren't out mingling them whilst they had a horribly infectious disease. Um, but anything that can dehydrate them as well is worth being careful if they've had a bout of vomiting a bout of diarrhea a dehydrated dog will also heat up much quicker and cool down slower so this is where we say kind of yes be at risk of the breeds but also know your dog and if they have had a bout of the squits then take it easy until you know they're fully recovered I think that, that makes sense as you would yourself wouldn't you? you yeah you wouldn't expect to go out for a run yourself would you if you've been ill and I, I think as well it it also highlights the, the sort of start of the season is to potentially that higher risk period of you've had the summer off because it's been coo um, sorry it's been hotter so July August you've eased off the dog's lost a bit of fitness and then you start picking them back up and potentially racing in September when we haven't quite cooled back down mm. but they've not got that fitness on the flip side to that they have potentially got used to the heat a little bit, so acclimatised to that. So that so it's really having an awareness of where your dog's at and how much you've done with them. Have you carried on ticking them over through the summer or have you had to stop? Um, in which case, are you suddenly ramping things up so come September time when actually it's still quite warm and quite humid out there? Yeah, and that's interesting because I've been off injured for three months. So, and I can see Pickle's fitness, and I know that I'm going to have to take her up slowly again to uh, get her fit. And, and she'll get there, I know that, because she's, uh, she will do. <laughs> she's yeah. um, but can I also ask, just sort of going back to you, Emily, about sort of obviously, you know, if your dog's ill and stuff. And I wouldn't take a dog to a race if she's in season, but is that going to affect her cooling um, as well when she's in season? Because you know, I'd still run her maybe slower because, you know, she's not, I know how she feels. You know. <laughs> it's again, it's an area that really needs work. Um, I know in human sports science, they're finally starting to, well, and actually some people have been doing this for decades, but yes, women's fitness and women's sport has historically been neglected horribly. And actually the influence of progesterone and estrogen, um, the, the sex hormones on the body as a whole, <sighs> we're not sure um so i mean theoretically yes they could get slightly hotter during certain stages of the cycle because of the influence those hormones are having on the rest of their body but we you know we don't have any hard and fast evidence so i think it'd be a case of, of keeping an eye on them um and just watching them during that period yeah and i just I, she slows down she, she she's quite happy to go out but she'll slow down and and, and that's fine i just go with her um, with her pace but uh, yeah no it's it's interesting you need to that's your next study then Anne and Emily <laughs> good lord <laughs> we, we have a, a list I think of um, potential areas to look at it's uh, it snowballs <laughs> so uh, sorry is that um are there any sort of sort of quick tips or tips your sort of top tips that you would do to to keep your dogs happy and cool just In... generally I suppose as well as canny crossing in general so not exercising it's it's knowing what they like because i think we've all known a black labrador that loves nothing more than collapsing in the sun and lying there for eight hours and you're thinking what are you doing <laughs> but they're fine um so i think it's, it's really watching them and it's giving them an opportunity to cool if they want it so the worst thing you can do is restrict a dog to an area and not give them the opportunity to cool themselves so, you know the, the times we see dogs overheating are when they're dragged out on you know a walk or a run and it's too hot for them or when they're shut somewhere hot so shut in a house shut in a conservatory shut in a vehicle um you know sadly even in the winter 
we we had cases where people's central heating had malfunctioned and they came home to a very very hot dog in a very very hot house so giving them places they can cool down making sure they're out of the sun water if they'll tolerate it so paddling pools are great wet towels are fine if you know at rest some dogs will quite like having a cooling coat put on if they're at rest crucially um it is quite refreshing whilst they're still cool and wet but beware when Anna and I looked at those in her back garden within 15 minutes they'd started to dry out so if you are going to put something like a cooling jacket or a wet towel on your dog you need to be constantly topping it up with water because as soon as it's dried out they're then just wearing a blanket which is probably not going to help. The wet towels are quite good if you can put them on the ground so they can lie on them and they've got that choice then of to whether they want to use them or not yeah. and I think also the, the kind of caveat to some of this and what Emily's been saying about allowing them to have that choice older dogs that are starting to have a bit of cognitive decline may not be aware that they're getting too hot so again yeah. they're the runs really to watch is older and younger dogs younger dogs overdoing it um, and just running around like idiots older dogs almost forgetting that they're getting too hot and getting out of the heat so making sure that that you're keeping a really close eye on them they're more likely to be dehydrated as well same as people um and if they're dehydrated and confused that's when yeah you're really going to get into trouble yeah it, it, it all kind of makes perfect sense isn't it and you do wonder why why some people take the dogs for a walk or go for a run with their dogs and yeah in the heat but i yeah. think sometimes it's that feeling of I mustn't exercise them when it's really hot so I'll go out early or later when it's cooled off but because it's cooler it doesn't necessarily mean it's cool enough and I think that's the key is not thinking well it was 30 degrees and it's now only 25 so I'm okay it's thinking well what's the actual temperature now and what's the implications of that and where am I taking them yeah. you know it, walking down the pavement in 25 degrees um is is going to be hot all round um and obviously a risk of, of burning pores as well which is not good trees trees yes, way lots forward. of, lots of woodland got, and undergrowth and yeah and you know it's the same in cities they've shown if you you know if you plant trees in a city you bring the whole temperature down mm. so if you have got areas that are wooded and covered and, and in shade then yeah that's how my parents walk their dog all year round as they take him to a forest for a walk and yeah outside the forest you're looking at 35 degrees and then under the canopy it's lovely so it's finding ways to to keep them going in a safe environment crucially that's what you were doing yesterday wasn't it michelle it was i was in the sunshine on a little canny cross run in the woods it was nice it was it was lovely and cool actually and we had the water to dip in and out of as well every time she she wanted to just cool her paws off Again, that's really key is if you can run somewhere or walk somewhere where you've got access to water, um, again, you can give them that opportunity if they'll take it both in terms of cooling off, but also rehydrating um, can be really crucial. No, that's fantastic. Is there anything else that sort of specifically for Canicross that we should be, uh, that we haven't covered that you think we should be thinking about? I think one of the key things for me is always if you're in any doubt, if you're questioning whether it's too hot, it probably is. Um, you know, it's always better to be overcautious and either go for a run on your own or not run at all. Then the it's the the age old, well, it was a bit warm, but. And I think if you're at that point of going, it's a bit warm, then you probably shouldn't have gone. Um, so we we don't have that definitive if the temperature humidity is x then it's too hot there's too many factors within that but at the same time and said it's it's really giving some thought to where you're at in your your canny cross journey whether that's time of year time of day your dog themselves their fitness their health their hydration and i think also not being influenced too much by other people and what they're doing again there are some people who will run their dogs in temperatures that personally i wouldn't um and there are people with temperatures cut off well below what i run my dogs in because they've got different types of dogs different breeds um so i think thinking about you and your situation is really key that's, that's good michelle have you got anything else you want to no, that's all been absolutely fascinating. Thank you, ladies. I've, I've learned a lot. Yeah. 
And um, yeah, it, it, it does just show you just need to pay a lot of attention to your dog and, and you know, yeah. know what's normal for it um, yeah. and pick up on those little signs because they can be so subtle. Fascinating. I'd, Thank you. I'd add that as a, you know, a final thought. If you're running someone else's dog and you don't know that dog as well, um, again, quite a few of the cases we saw dogs had been exercised by a dog walker. So, you know, this is someone who is not familiar with the animal. Could you pick up on the subtle clues if you were running with somebody else's animal? And, you know, could you keep them safe? Yes. And um, that thought. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> And I think one of the things that we haven't mentioned in terms of cooling them down that can be really useful is your aircon in your car. If you get back to your car and your dog is hot, whack the aircon on full blast and get them in the car. Um, the vent. Yeah, because that can be such an easy and quick way to just drop that body temperature if you haven't got water or if you've doused them in water, um, you know, and then get the aircon on and get them to the vats and and seek veterinary advice. Again, it, it, it it's a vet can have much more effective cooling mechanisms um, and can cool them much quicker and monitor them. So if you do think that they've been suffering from heat stroke, get them cooled down where you can, but then get them to the vets. Yeah, no, that's, that's fantastic. So ladies, where can people find out? Uh, you've got a blog, haven't you? So do, um, can they follow you anywhere on social media or? <laughs> so the blog is heatstroke.dog. Um, heatstroke.dog takes you to the blog and then um, hot dogs. Is it just hot dogs actually on Twitter? I think we're hot dogs on Twitter and we're on Facebook as well. Um, Link, links to both are on the blog. Yeah. So. And the blog has access if you're interested in more of the the sciencey bit of it all there's access to all our research papers from the kind of complete hot dogs picture um, and all of the different things we've been doing in terms of different thermometers canny cross research the veterinary research so there's lots and lots to read on there but also some hopefully really useful kind of guides on keeping your dog cool and and how to to look after them um, and some of the, the sort of blog posts we've written on that too so lots and lots on there to have a look at Fantastic. And thank you very much for your time. Not a problem. It's been lovely to chat. Right. Always nice to talk about Canicross and, and research. <laughs>